Hi. Hello. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so uh, you're at So You Want to Market Your Security Product. This is going to be a little bit of a marketing 101 and ways to not get in trouble with the Federal Trade Commission, which is the agency that we're here representing, uh, which is an agency that does consumer protection but also monitors advertising and marketing practices and in industries around the economy. So a little bit about us. I'm Terrell McSweeney. I'm a commissioner at the FTC and a lawyer. I'm Aaron Alba. I'm a technologist at the FTC in our relatively new research group called OTEC. Um, and uh, about the roles that we do uh, at the FTC, I uh, do in-house research on technical aspects that impact consumers, anything from network traffic analysis on smart TVs to understanding cross-device tracking. Um, I also assist uh, our attorneys in the technical aspects of the law enforcement um, investigations that we bring. So we're going to be reviewing a ton of uh, practical tips and legal advice and different things today based on the FTC's precedent in this area, but we're going to start with the usual disclaimer that we're not representing the official views of the FTC uh, and you can't quote us to, to take us to court on the stuff we're going to tell you because this is meant to be helpful advice that you can use in thinking about how to market your security products or uh, that researchers can use in thinking about whether claims being made about products are deceptive. Okay, overview. What we're going to try to accomplish today is to give you a good sense of what the FTC is doing in this space, when we bring cases, cases being enforcement actions that are civil proceedings against companies that are either doing something that is deceptive or unfair, uh, and also how we create guidance for business and industry when we do our own research through OTAC and other parts of the agency, and how we work with the security research community. So what is the FTC, you might be wondering. It is the Federal Trade Commission. Uh Sort of surprisingly, given that the word trade is in the name of the agency, we don't do anything with trade at all. In fact, we uh, are a hundred and three-year-old consumer protection agency that's focused on protecting consumers from unfair, deceptive acts and practices, and also uh, protecting consumers and marketplaces from unfair competition and competitive practices. We basically have two main bureaus that focus on these areas, consumer protection and competition, and we also have a Bureau of Economics that helps both bureaus in that mission. We undertake our mission primarily by bringing cases. These are enforcement actions, again, civil, not criminal, against companies that are in violation of the various 70-plus statutes that we enforce, but we also engage in business education and consumer education, so this is definitely the consumer business education portion of, of our mission. We engage in workshops, we do our own research, and um, we've also, importantly, recently, in recent years, in, uh, using our America Competes Act Authority, had challenges to spur innovation in the marketplace, and today we actually announced the winner of our Home Inspector Challenge. I'm really excited about this. It was a $25,000 cash prize that went to an app that's going to help uh, consumers figure out what IoT they have on their home networks and whether it needs to be updated or has a patch available for it. So we're excited that we're also using some of our tools to spur innovation and reward it in the marketplace as well. So why are we here today? Uh, the, there are plenty of marketing materials that you see out uh, that leverage fear, uncertainty, and doubt, or FUD. These are scare tactics that, uh, that make use of psychological factors and feelings and stereotypes. So we all can laugh about the hacker in the hoodie, and in this case has no face uh, in front of a computer as scary green code scrolls by. But these are things that invoke these stereotypes that play into um, company, people and companies' decisions on whether or not to purchase a particular security product. Today we're going to talk about the truth in advertising laws that uh, the FTC enforces through its FTC Act and that all companies in America, including marketers of security products, are subject to these laws. And it's important to note that the Federal Trade Commission is a federal level agency that enforces these laws, but we also have partnerships with state attorney generals, and almost every state has its 
own analog, um, similar set of laws that also um, have a similar requirements. You cannot deceive people through advertising and marketing in, in the marketplace. So we'll be talking a little bit more about that and some of the examples of cases where people have run into trouble around these issues. So truth in advertising 101. We will be talking about some legal concepts here. We're going to move quickly and post the slides later, so please don't worry if you get hung up on a term. We want to do some basics. But um, this is really not rocket science. When it comes down to it, what we're talking about here is telling the truth and telling the whole truth. We talk about this legal concept of deception, okay? So let me unpack that for a minute. Essentially what deception is, and these are the elements of it, which is a very legal way to think about it, but if you want to think about it in a very pragmatic way, it is are the claims that are being made about this product important to a reasonable, reasonable person's decision about whether to buy or use it? There are three types of claims. There is pretty obviously an express claim, which is a claim that is just a claim that is being made. There are implied claims and claims of omission, and we'll be unpacking those for you as we go through examples where, where mistakes were made. So as Terrell mentioned, an express claim is an explicit statement that a company makes. And an example of an explicit, explicit statement a company makes is a company such as Henry Schein, which is a uh, provider of dental software equipment, or excuse me, of dental software uh, for dental, off dental offices, um, says, hey, we're going to provide you this patient information database that's a SQL database, and it encrypts uh, the information at rest. Um, <laughs> And where this gets problematic from an FTC standpoint is when you make an express claim but don't actually follow through with that claim. And so in this case, the express claim is you have encrypted data at rest, you've used an encrypted format, but actually uh, in the case of Henry Schein, they only used a vendor's weak obfuscation algorithm. So here, the, and there was a statement that was expressed and it was not followed. And what encryption means is actually a um, specific technical term, as we all know, um, and that the FTC will look uh, generally to things like what an industry, industry standard is for encryption, and in this case, weak obfuscation algorithms did, certainly did not meet that. And while it may be obvious to all of us in the room the difference between these two very technical concepts, it can not it's not always obvious to everybody, which is why we really are arguing that everybody has a role to play in making sure that truthful claims are being made. Engineers and technologists may understand these concepts very clearly, but if they're disconnected from the marketing department in your organization, there may be no one who's able to explain whether something is actually truthful or not, based on how the product is working. So the second type of claims that are made to consumers uh, or made generally are implied claims. Implied claims give the, an overall meaning that gives them a strong impression of something. So in this case with, FT, uh, with KFC, um, KFC had a series of ads that implied healthy eating. Uh, essentially, hey, remember how we talked about eating better as the woman puts the large bucket of uh, KFC fried chicken on the kitchen counter? Um, and these were comparative impressions that made it seem to consumers like eating KFC chicken breasts were healthier than a Whopper. And the overall impression, though, was false, uh, was deceptive because as a whole, KFC chicken breasts actually had much more trans fat, more cholesterol, more sodium, and more calories than what it was being compared to, which was the Whopper. So the last type of claim is a, is a claim that is actually a half-truth, so a deception by omission. If you're not telling the whole truth about something in a meaningful way, then you can run afoul of the requirement to not deceive consumers. For example? Um, the, if, you, if, a company, if you're a company and you're um, selling a product, like Bitcoin mining machines, and you fail to tell the consumer that you're going to use the product first for yourself uh, or that you're going to ship the product um, six months down the road, then these two things are uh, omissions by the company. So the omission in Butterfly Labs was 
Yes, this company manufactured Bitcoin mining equipment, used ASICs and app in integrated specific circuits, uh, and uh, was selling these off to consumers. Uh, but actually, before they sent them off to consumers, they pulled all of the machines together, did Bitcoin mining for themselves before sending them along. Um, and this was something that, as a consumer, uh, would influence my decision um, in purchasing the product because the computational complexity uh, of Bitcoin mining and the fact that as time goes on, more Bitcoins are already mined and there's only a limited number of Bitcoins. All of these played into the fact that failing to say that you've already used the equipment um, was an omission um, from consumers. Uh, another kind of omission we take a very dim view of generally at the FTC is omissions about things that cost money, especially if one is claiming that they are free. So if you're marketing your product as free, but there is a mandatory cancellation fee, then it is not free. So free means free. Free is not free if there is a fee. I just like to say it that way. Uh, all right, so we've been going through some of the basic legal concepts that underpin when uh, you may be running afoul of a restriction against marketing something in an unfair or deceptive way. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about Marketing 101. We've been talking about claims, and of course the first uh, component here again is being honest concept that should be relatively straightforward. We're also going to review some of the other areas here that are a little bit confusing, such as exaggeration versus actual deception, what proof you actually need if you're making claims, and what disclosures are really required when you're making uh, disclosures or endorsements or saying something is certified by a certifying agency or authority. Okay, so key attributes. This is, I think, one of the most important areas and an area where we really tend to need more people who understand exactly how the tech is working to be in conversation and talking with the people who are, in fact, marketing it. So uh, this is essentially what does this product do and another key attribute generally, especially if you're selling it to consumers, is how much does it cost? Um, we're gonna give you some real live uh, kind of examples from the security space of when companies got into trouble for overstating what the products they were marketing were actually capable of. Does everybody remember uh, back in the 2010s, the uh, CEO of LifeLock always putting his full social security number on ads? Uh, this gave a very strong impression that um, no matter what type of consumer information you have out there, um, the, that LifeLock, if you purchase their service, would protect you from unauthorized use or misuse of your personal information. This was uh, a really good example of a, a broad uh, overstatement that gives a really strong impression that LifeLock can do everything possible for you uh, in protecting you and proactively uh, protecting you from identity theft. Um, and whereas in looking at what LifeLock actually did, in fact, um, LifeLock failed to do a number of things that would have actually provided that level of protection that they were making out um, to do as part of their service. Um, one example is that they failed to do any sort of protection or monitoring over any sensitive health information um, that was out there um, from you uh, in terms of protecting you from misuse of that information. Uh, they failed to also protect your employee uh, information uh, from theft, which is a large form of uh, avenue for identity theft that we've seen. Um, and uh, in terms of their, and they also failed to do um, timely monitoring of even your credit reports. So uh, failed to do things like looking for integrity um, checks. So they, if your address on your credit report was changed, um, LifeLock at the time would not actually catch that, um, even though they're making out this broad representation to do that. Um, it, this kind of thing is particularly harmful, right? Because uh, identity theft is year over year our top or second top consumer complaint in our complaint system. We know that consumers in America are victims of uh, lots of different variations of identity theft. It is a big problem. And falsely assuring people that they can be perfectly protected in a connected environment is uh, is always going to be a claim that we're going to look really carefully at in case people rely on it to their own detriment. That's right. 
Um, and then we could go on and on about um, this particular case, such as other things around data security and failures to do encryption and so forth. But this gives you a good example of not overstating the claims that you make uh, and the impressions that you make um, uh, when you're marketing uh, your products. Another good example is from 2004. In 2004, Bonsai Software was marketing this uh, product called Internet Alert that uh, if it said if you download and protect yourself now, it'll protect you from uh, internet attackers and that you were vulnerable to internet attackers. What the software actually did when you looked under the hood was monitor automatically 21 ports. Um, and interestingly, if there was a port that was already open when you first installed Internet Alert, it would not monitor that port. Uh, so 8080, I'm sure, is open on every computer. Uh, it was not monitoring for unauthorized attacks on 8080. Um, further, if you had a port that was closed that was in their 21, list of 21 ports that was automatically being monitored, um, say something like Telnet maybe, um, it would open that port in order to monitor that port. Um, so this is something that is quite dangerous because it obviously, as we all know here, opens the attack surface for any computer. Um, and as the FTC said in its complaint, does not significantly reduce the risk of unauthorized access into computers. And again, I love that everybody in this audience kind of chuckles when we talk about the way this thing was working and it's obvious what the problem is. But again, remember, to a lay audience, to a reasonable consumer, this is not at all an obvious thing. Uh, you have to have people that understand the technology really translate and explain back to people how it's working. I don't know exactly what went on with this particular company if they were intentionally doing this or, or if it was really just a question of marketing kind of getting way out in front of what the product actually was. Okay, so speaking of getting way out in front, um, there is a concept here called puffery, which we just want to cover really quickly. Puffery is essentially exaggeration. Uh, I think everybody understands that sometimes people get really excited about the thing. They want to say great things about it. Um, that is all perfectly legal in, in certain situations when it falls into the sort of puffery category. And where it crosses into deception is when it becomes a slightly more verifiable claim. So if I want to say it is a miracle cybersecurity product, then there's nothing really to substantiate about using an adjective or saying something is miraculous. Uh, but if you want to say 100% uh, of security researchers believe it is a miracle, then you might be crossing into the territory where you're making a claim that needs to be substantiated in some way. And one note around puffery and deception is that, again, remember the audience that you're marketing to. Uh, if you're marketing your security product to consumers, regular consumers, um, then, it's, then the FTC will generally evaluate claims uh, in the position or in the shoes of those consumers. And so uh, the consumer that is not in IT, uh, you, your family member not, that's not in IT, or your, or your uh, friends that are not in IT, uh, if you were to think about what what their perception of this marketing would be, those are the types of impressions and perceptions that the FTC looks at when evaluating these types of claims. Okay, so how what do we mean by substantiation? What is it that you need to support a claim that you are making, assuming it is a truthful claim? Well. Really, it's pretty straightforward. It's whatever is sort of appropriate and reliable and testing that is recognized as uh, and accepted in the industry in which you're operating. So um, it depends a little bit on the claim, but essentially it's have proof in a sensible way that other experts in your industry would recognize as proof, um, whether that's a test or something else, and, and use that. Uh, so some examples of, of that would require substantiation, you can imagine this would be relatively straightforward in most cases, is uh, our product guards against 100% of known ransomware variants. Um, that's probably possible to substantiate if you can figure out what 100% of known ransomware variants is. 
that's a challenge, but maybe you can do it. Um, the number one selling protection among Fortune 500 companies. Okay, well, then you would also need to be able to, to know that was the case, right? So you'd have to have some data about whether uh, it was, in fact, a number one selling product. Um, or, uh, again, these other claims. You can, you can sort of figure out the, the math or the information or the facts that you would need in order to say that this was true. Another key tenet around Marketing 101 is knowing your endorsements and certifications. Uh, the key is handling these is disclose who got paid. Um, think about a, a friend that you trust and you go to that friend and that friend says, hey, I just, uh, I'm using this great product and I highly recommend it. I think it's been great for me. Um, I would think that it would be quite relevant for me to know whether that friend was actually getting paid in order to provide that sort of uh, endorsement. So the overall concept here is that if you are endorsed, if you're having someone endorse your product, uh, then, and you're paying that person or you're giving them some material benefit like uh, the product for free or at a discount, then that person that's endorsing needs to disclose up front um, what type of benefit they, they got, whether it was paid or the free product or whatnot. Um, the idea, again, is that um, knowing the connection uh, between the endorser and the company is important for the consumer in how they evaluate the, or weigh the claim. Uh, so one example uh, is around the area of certifications. Um, last year, uh, there was a company that, uh, indoor tanning bed company that had been um, talking a lot about the benefits of vitamin D and had this certification um, or this approval um, that you see on the screen that says vitamin D council approved. Um, what the company failed to do was actually disclose that they had arranged a payment to this vitamin D council in exchange for this type of certification mark. And this type of certification mark would be uh, relevant and was relevant to consumers in deciding whether to purchase the product or not. Also just a note here, if you're paying uh, someone to certify your product as something and they have no actual expertise in the industry or the product, probably a good idea to, to disclose that as well. Uh, in the area of endorsers, uh, even, if you're, even if you as a company are going to uh, an ad firm and saying, hey ad firm, go find um, some influencers and go find some en endorsers and then pay them in it, uh, for them to give a good review of your product. You need to make sure all the way down the line, all the way down to the person that's actually endorsing um, that, that that person is actually making the disclosure that they were paid or that they were given product. Um, so it, last year, Machinima uh, was contracted by Microsoft to show, um, to hire influencers uh, to show off the new Xbox One and a few games in a good light, a few YouTube influencers that had hundreds of thousands of views on their review about the Xbox One where they didn't mention um, the, that they were actually getting paid, um, uh, actually went through with that and uh, the FTC brought a case against Machina for failing to make sure that the influencers um, made that disclosure so that consumers could be better informed. So we've covered some of the legal basics and given you some examples where people ran afoul of them. Now what we want to do is talk affirmatively about steps you can take to make sure that you don't run into these problems yourself. The first one is, is probably pretty obvious, which is take a minute, list some of the express and implied claims that are being made about the products and, and think about them and go through them. Uh, one test I like to use about whether you are, these are claims and how they're being perceived is running them by someone who is, is a reasonable consumer, right? Someone who is maybe not super familiar with the product or even the industry, is otherwise a reasonable person. Maybe call your mom if she is a reasonable person or your mother-in-law or someone else. Just run it by them and see what they think a claim means because it can be a very good benchmark in assessing uh, what's happening with the marketing material. And you as technical folks, as security folks, um, you can do these things in really practical, concrete ways. Consider uh, if your firm is big enough and has a marketing department, go to the marketing department and say, hey, let's all sit down together and go through uh, the types of claims that we're making in the ads um, that we put out for 
our product because you have the technical expertise, you have the ability to say whether or not a claim that your company is making is actually accurate um, based on what your product is actually doing. Um, and so that's one of the ways that you can get involved in what your company is doing to make sure that the claims that your company is making uh, are not deceptive or misleading to consumers. Well, that's a perfect segue into our next slide, which is as you're doing this exercise, think about are these claims accurate? Are we saying things that are truthful about the way these products are working? So uh, again, when we talked about the earlier example around encryption, if, you, if your marketing materials you find, say, you use encryption, but you're using just a weak obfuscation algorithm, then that's something where you can go to, uh, that's something where, well, first of all, you should probably consider using encryption. Um, mm -hmm. But that aside, uh, you should make sure that the, these claims that are being made in the market materials are accurate. Uh, similarly, if you're offering something like an SDK or something to developers uh, that, are, that you're selling to developers or providing to external developers, make sure the documentation itself is not deceiving to developers. Make sure that you're being truthful about what you're doing. So the Imobi case um, was a case where an ad network in Mobi was providing an SDK to app developers. App developers could integrate this SDK into their app and make use of Imobi's ad networks um, for advertising. Uh, what Imobi was doing uh, and what they did not tell developers that were, in a, was, were integrating this SDK was that they were collecting BSSIDs, um, the, the names of the access points and MAC addresses of access points nearby, triangulating them on their own backend database and providing location, geolocation information for advertising targeting purposes. And this was all done um, without the actual explicit consent of the consumer down the road that was using the app um, through the use of the OS level location controls. Well, in fact, it was done even when the consumer had explicitly opted out of having geolocation tracking done, so that made it even more of a problem from a privacy perspective. But here the important point, I think, too, is just looking at the representations that are being made in the business-to-business -business context and in a sales context as well. Okay, so while you are in this process of thinking about the claims that are being made, think about whether you actually can prove the claims, right? Think about these, this issue of substantiation and what claims that are explicit need to be proved and what kind of proof might be required. And this is a pro tip. It's a really good idea to have that proof on hand before the claims are actually being made to the public. Similarly, make sure your endorsers disclose, as we talked about, and make sure your uh, certifications are not deceptive. And again, we'll, we'll have these slides available. Please use these as a resource and go back through the Marketing 101 principles and kind of make sure that, the comp that your companies are actually adhering to these. Um, and just because everyone else is spewing FUD or because you see deception in the marketplace, it's not okay. If you see FUD happening generally, please let us know. You're uh, welcome to file a complaint with FTC uh, or let a self-regulatory body know. Okay, this is also the bonus edition of What Can You Do? We're gonna add IoT companies even if they're not explicitly security companies because one of the things that keeps me up at night is our patchwork IoT security in the marketplace and tons of insecure IoT. There's some additional issues associated with marketing of IoT that companies need to be aware of. It's really important that consumers understand whether the product is going to function as a dumb product if, for example, it is a connected toaster and it is only going to be supported for a couple of years, then consumers should know whether it is going to continue to toast their bagels once the security uh, lapses and the connection is turned off. Similarly, if it's a connected toaster, and I'm picking on toasters because I really think they're the dumbest thing in the world to connect to the internet, just to be clear, 
but I'm told this, this idea is still out there. Um, if, if you're selling something that, uh, that is only going to be supported um, and have connected functionality for a limited period of time, such as a year or two, and it is something like a toaster, consumers are gonna need to know upfront that the connected portions of, of that product are only gonna last a very short amount of time because they may have an impression from the brick and mortar world and the analog world about how long that product is going to last them. So these are important marketing, communication uh, issues that are coming up in the IoT space that should be very much a part of this conversation as well. Be clear with your consumers ahead of time about what functions are going to be included and how long they will be supported. So we've talked about uh, marketing 101, we've talked about deception. Uh, we want to shift our focus a little bit to security researchers specifically. Researchers do a lot of great work that is very instructive and enlightening to consumers and to people that read and understand and keep track of what's going on in the marketplace. That's people like us, by the way. Yes. <laughs> um, so researchers, if you are uh, doing your own research project or if you're embarking on something new, look, be on the lookout for deceptive claims. Uh, look out for them uh, and note them when you see them. Um, question the claims, just like with the Marketing 101 materials. Are there potentially deceptive claims in the product or service that I'm looking at right now? Uh, is the company being truthful about their key attributes? Uh, can the company actually substantiate the numbers that they're providing or the tests that they've said um, are backing up the product that they have? Um, and what is particularly tricky, obviously, is when you have no explicit statement about something that might be going on that's problematic, um, exposing what that is. And so looking out for omissions or things that were really important to a consumer's decision on whether or not to purchase a product, um, be on the lookout for those and um, be um, open to calling those out if you see those. This is true, by the way, of security claims, which is the focus of this presentation, but it's also very true of privacy and information use claims as well. And so here's some concrete things as you're publishing research, as you're speaking about research, as you're blogging on research. These are concrete things that are helpful um, for the FTC generally. Um, and please let us know and please consider uh, as you're going through a write-up of your research uh, uh, trying to hit each point of these. So one of the helpful things is showing what the claim actually was. Um, if you see a claim, whether it's on a box, if you're looking at an IoT security product, um, or uh, in the checkout flow as you're purchasing the product, um, note or screenshot or show in your research as you present it uh, what that claim actually was and where you found it. Um, Describe, obviously, what research you did. That's pretty straightforward. That's what you're doing. Um, and is your research reproducible? Uh, consider uh, laying out the specific steps that you've taken as you've gone about your research, or research, how you found the vulnerability, how you found the design flaw, how you led yourself to find uh, a particular finding um, that you've discovered or, uh, or come across. Um, reproducibility is generally helpful for um, uh, attesting to the accuracy and, and to seeing potentially the breadth of the issue. Um, and so this can be things like reproducibility as in listing out uh, the steps you took, providing code snippets, providing configurations. Think about if, you're, if you are in any bug bounty programs and you submit to bug bounty, uh, you may get a response back from the company saying, hey, how did you find this bug? Can you help me through steps on reproducing it? Laying that out up front is very helpful. Um, as you're publishing your research. Um, discuss in your own terms how you think the claim was deceptive um, and why you think it's deceptive or what type of impression you think that the claim was making that you think could be deceptive to consumers. Um, and discuss in your own words, too, how you think this actually impacts consumers. Um, it's good to hear from researchers' uh, 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 researchers' views on how they think particular things impact consumers. And really, let us know. Uh, feel free to file a complaint on ftc.gov. Uh, and more importantly, please send us your research uh, to research at ftc.gov. We read every single email that goes to research at ftc.gov. 
Uh, and we do, and an important note on this, many of these kinds of complaints and pieces of information do help inform our enforcement, help us decide whether to open an investigation, and sometimes, ultimately, those investigations result in cases. So if we do decide to open an investigation, you may not hear from us initially, because at that point, the presence of the investigation is non-public, so we're not allowed to communicate about it at all. But if you ultimately see a case resulting from it, you can know that we relied on the information. And know that there are some uh, new recent legal protections for security researchers. So if you're interested in doing research around uh, IoT products uh, for consumers, uh, there is a new DMCA legal research uh, uh, exemption that protects you from suit, uh, DMCA suits uh, from the companies that you're researching. Uh, please make sure that you follow the boundaries of that, which uh, I've laid out in a blog post in the past, uh, and others have laid out. Um, I'm not your lawyer, see a lawyer, and please make note that there are other laws that, uh, that, will, that this specific exemption won't protect you from laws like the CFAA. Uh, but really, uh, and really stay within the scope of your research. Obviously, it doesn't authorize you to uh, steal a toaster, uh, <laughs> hack into a neighbor's toaster, uh, set toasters on fire next to flammable materials. Um, but these are things that... But if you have a connected toaster and want to set it on fire, I would not hold it against you at all. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there's some other promising legal developments that we just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of. Uh, this, is, this falls in the category of new laws you can use, and it's kind of exciting. Last December, the Congress actually passed a law. Uh, I know it's an unusual thing in this environment. Um, this is called the Consumer Fairness and Review Act. And what it does is it essentially um, pro protects individuals' ability to provide honest reviews on all different kinds of platforms on the internet and eliminates this idea that you can be gagged from doing that if you're, if you're using the product and it's a product you're providing, providing a review on. I'm really excited about this. This is something the FTC will start enforcing uh, come December of this year. And so what does this mean concretely for uh, for us here in the audience, it means that um, when you see a uh, contractual term in a term of so service or a EULA or any sort of contract that is made uh, in a purchase or use of a service, then uh, if you see a term that is a gag clause that stops, uh, that says, hey, consumer, you can't write a review of our product, uh, or hey, we'll punish you if you write a review of our Product, those clauses are going to be called void under the law, and it, they could be directly subject to um, civil penalties by the FTC when enforcement starts in December. So if you see this, if you run across legal documents in your company where the contract that you have or the terms of service you have um, has these gag clauses or has these anti-benchmarking clauses, please flag this because once enforcement starts, uh, you could be subject to um, civil penalty for having those in place, even, even if you don't use them. But I think also particularly if they are being used to suppress a sharing of an honest review, um, then that is something that, that should be flagged at this point because it is, it is already, the law is already in effect. Uh, and the, the FCC and state attorneys generals have been interested in this area in the past. Um, uh, for instance, the uh, New York AG's office has taken action against um, the use of anti-benchmarking clauses um, and against security companies in the past as well. Um, so please stay mindful of these things. Um, the idea around prohibiting gag clauses is really around making sure that the information out in the marketplace is out there and available so that consumers and people that are buying products can have a really holistic picture of what is available and understand what are the trade-offs between selecting a particular product versus another product. So we are approaching the conclusion of our presentation. We are going to have time to take uh, some questions, so I hope people stick around. Um, if you've been sleeping, now is the time to wake up. We will summarize exactly what we've just said in the last 30 minutes, and it's essentially uh, be truthful about the claims that you were making about the products that you were selling, and be mindful of uh, others who are not being truthful. Please stay in touch with us, um, file a complaint, send us your research to research at ftc.gov. 
please, we will, uh, Black Hat will be posting these slides, I believe, at the end of the day. Um, and we may be posting the slides as well. Um, um, use these slides as a resource as you're talking to your marketing staff, as you're talking to uh, people that are um, in, your, uh, in your company or outside of your company that are marketing security products. We want to make sure that the claims that are out there are not misleading and deceptive to consumers. Uh, and uh, I think we can all do our part as security professionals uh, to help make sure that consumers are, uh, are seeing claims that are, are truthful. Um, so thank you so much for your time, uh, and we're happy to take some questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes. Hello. Uh, first of all, excellent initiative, excellent talk. Um, thank you guys for thank doing you. this. Now, I'm going to create a bit of context around my question, okay? Okay. Um, first of all, there's a number of companies right down there. And uh, I'm sure none of them breach any of the rules you guys outlined. None of them. Yeah. Uh, so I, I guess my first question it would be, how are you guys not swamped with work, <laughs> considering what we're seeing around us? And my second question is, um, we've been doing some research on, on IoT. That's kind of one of the things that we're doing. And uh, we saw that it was advertising that they're using encryption and they were only using encryption in one of the modules and no encryption in one of the other modules that was leaking very sensible information. Uh, and um, we reported it to, to the company. Uh, they, ignore not, they ignored us. So I was wondering if reporting stuff to the FTC would be part of the responsible disclosure process. I mean, before publishing, before you know, presenting it at conferences, maybe we should, uh, you know, if you don't answer, we're gonna, you know, Tell you, we're going to tell on, uh, tell on you to the FTC or something. Well, uh, these are two really, really good questions. And to take your first question first, which is how are we not swamped? Uh, well, first of all, one thing the FTC likes to do is engage directly with industries and communities about what their responsibilities are and provide a period of time of education so hopefully people can avoid having investigations and running afoul of the law because they know what the requirements are. So we're very actively engaged both with our Start With Security initiative and our Stick With Security initiative and uh, through presentations like this and trying to make sure that the industry understands what some of these responsibilities are. Um, we are concerned, I think that's why we're here today talking about it, because we want to make sure that um, consumers and even other businesses are able to rely on accurate claims and that products are doing what they say they do. We have a challenge in this marketplace because it's really hard to create proper incentives for products to be fully secure since the end user doesn't really know what the security is and can't really access that when they're standing in the store or buying the product online. Uh, so we're trying to figure out ways to make sure that we can get more truthful information to, uh, into the demand side of the market to hopefully create a better set of incentives. So I think we're watching it very carefully and we have actually been bringing cases and I expect that we will continue to do that. Um, secondly, to your point about something not really working the way it was working or not being properly encrypted, in fact, we have brought cases when things were not properly encrypted um, and we're leaking sensitive consumer information. That's the type of fact pattern that we certainly would be very interested in um, from an enforcement perspective. We generally try to prioritize our enforcement based on the sensitivity of the consumer information at stake, the likelihood that the vulnerability could be exploited, um, th some of those areas. So if it's something uh, where we're not dealing with incredibly sensitive information, it may be less of a priority than, than the other way around. Uh, we've been very interested, for example, in um, improperly secured devices that uh, you know allow people's, uh, like a security camera that allows feed from your house to be on the public internet and some of those issues where, where we really take a very strong view about protecting the sensitivity and privacy of your home. Sensitive information also includes uh, personally identifiable information, financial information, health information, the content of communications, geolocation, as long as it's relatively precise. Um, so these are areas that, and children's information, of course, um, that, that are very, very important to us. In terms of thinking about prioritizing enforcement in, in deceptive marketing in this space, I think, again, we'd be looking at areas where um, 
someone is being significantly misled, perhaps to their detriment, um, if they've paid money for something that doesn't really work or they were charged a fee when they thought it was free. Um, these are areas that are relatively um, easy for us in terms of thinking about where the harm is. Um, Increasingly, we're also looking at cases where someone is making claims um, that privacy settings are being honored, and when in fact there's a cute technical workaround around those settings, that's um, like the InMobi case. So in a situation where the, the consumer's expressed uh, privacy choice is not actually being honored, um, that's an area where, where we're looking carefully as well. So the question was, should the FTC be uh, included in the responsible disclosure process? Well, so I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting suggestion. Um, I'm certainly not opposed to it. We do believe that responsible disclosure is part of having a reasonable security program. Um, responsible disclosure means not just being able to receive the information, but also responding to it. So, um, you know, I think if you're getting no response, then um, it is uh, potentially responsible to, to alert us to that fact as well. Of course, state attorney generals have similar authorities. Um, that might be particularly important depending on the kind of thing it is. So I get very concerned, for example, if we see a lot of publicity around medical devices, which could be life-threatening to people. Um, but I, you know, I think this is part of the conversation that we've been having at the federal level about what is a responsible disclosure program and how should we um, think about res who's responsible for what and what to do in situations where there isn't responsiveness when there should be. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks again, uh, again for the presentation and amazing piece of education as well. So my question is, uh, if uh, a tester slash certification authority procures for a license uh, without disclosing they're actually going to use that license to test the product, uh, first of all, is it legal for the testing authority to do that? And second, if the company later finds out and revokes the license in the process of certification, is that legal as well? Thank you. Uh it's a really interesting set of questions, and since I am a consumer protection lawyer, I don't want to give you like a legal answer to them. I think the question is going to really come down to uh, what the what the terms are um, in in the agreements between the two parties, right? Um, there are some exemptions now, um, as we've noted in the Copyright Act that are really intended to allow for research to occur on products that are legally acquired. And, and I think those can be very, very helpful. But I hate generalizing in this space because facts do matter. And, and the specific situation um, probably requires uh, some lawyers to take a look at it. Basically, it's uh, enforced since March, right? It's not been enforced right now, but it's already enforced since March this year. The exemptions. Yes. Yes. Um, and the, C the CFRA. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, the reviews. Oh, that that just reviews, not the research, test, and certification. Right. The exemptions went into place last year, I think. Is that right? Um, or two years ago? I can't remember what year we're in now. Um, but the Consumer Fairness Review Act um, went into law in December of this year. We've been actively sort of putting people, putting the message out about it so that industry has a chance to take a look. And we won't start enforcing it until December of this year. Right, but is it te tester, is, is, can tester be uh, considered a uh, consumer as well for this case? Like if I buy a license and I'm yeah. going to test, can I be considered a consumer? Although I have an interest of uh, testing the product specifically, not probably if just using it. I th I, these are areas where I think we're going to need to explore a little bit the language of the statute. I think in the statute, if, if you are a consumer who buys the thing to use it, um, and, uh, and one of the things you do is test it, um, then I think you'll be able to provide an honest review of it. But I suspect that we will be arguing over interpretation of the statute in areas like this once we start to enforce it. Awesome. Thanks so much.
Hi. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, I have a question around um, consumer-facing devices, things that range from, say, smart thermostats or connected toys. Is there any sort of momentum in the industry for a framework, whether it's voluntarily and industry-led or you know, maybe at some point regulatory, to um, give purchasers of, of these types of items uh, an easy way to understand the privacy and security implications? It's, as, as security professionals, it's hard enough for us to understand that. And as lay people, it's pretty much impossible. So you know, is there a work going on either on the government side or the industry side around the equivalent of nutrition facts box, so to speak? So yeah, there's some really promising efforts because I completely agree with you. One of the most frustrating things is that it's impossible as a consumer to figure out what the security is around the product, especially if you're sitting there in the store trying to figure out what to buy. So um, Consumers Union, Consumer Reports is working on a project where they're trying to come up with a labeling system, a ranking system. I think that could be very helpful. Right now, they're trying to figure out what are the standards that should go into that so that we can all interact with it. And there's some other organizations that are also thinking about uh, promulgating self-regulatory standards in this space so that we can understand how to benchmark and create some kind of labeling system. Right now, we don't even know how that could be meaningful because there isn't standards that we can point to. Right, exactly. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Sorry, we're out of time.